All I have to do is say the word mom, and you probably instantly have a picture in your head. For me, not only do I have the visuals of my mom, pre-cancer, pre-chemo you know, chemo and radiation, where she was skinnier, I also see that blonde hair. I can smell the hairspray coming off of that blonde hair that my mom used to coat on real nice and thick. And I can see her curling her hair in front of a mirror. I instantly think of that all the time. But I also think of being a little boy. And I wouldn't sleep very well in my own bed. And I can remember being at four or five and having to convince my mom to sleep on the couch with me. And we would sleep head to head, my head touching her head, and my feet facing one end of the couch and her feet facing the other of the long sectional couch. I can remember that love. And I'm sure that you can think of your own mom. And all the things that they have happened in, in your relationship together. All, maybe some special words she said to you. So I have to begin by saying, Happy Mother's Day. And that word might conjure, or that phrase might conjure nostalgia. It might conjure some regret and loss and pain. Those of us that miss our moms. Those of us who had challenges. Those of us who saw a child go to heaven before we were ready for them to. Right? Whichever feelings uh, apply to you, may you have a blessed Mother's Day and may God multiply your joys and deal with any sorrows you might have by comforting you today. But even if you aren't a mom, you have one. And we're going to do something a little different than we did last year. Last year, we did three testimonies, my story about how my mom impacted me, and then we had Romy and Carrie. Those are up on YouTube, and I reshared them on Facebook. I think they're wonderful. But you know, we were going through Scripture, and we spent some time with a young mom last week. We typically go chapter by chapter, verse by verse here to make sure we understand the context of Scripture. And as we were doing so, we, we heard about this young lady named Mary, pregnant about 14 or 15 by the Holy Spirit, who's going to give birth to Jesus. And instantly you're going to think, well, that's the Christmas story, right? Sam, why are you doing the Christmas story on Mother's Day? You're crazy. Well, the first service really thought I was crazy because there were guests here. And because I did the baptism in the first service, I was running around in shorts and barefoot. And I was trying to tell people, you know, I am a hillbilly from Kentucky, but we're not exactly that hillbilly here. It's a baptism. But yes, it is a little strange, you might think, to look at the birth story or the Christmas story for Mother's Day. But you know what? It's actually really appropriate. This young mom had a very special birth story. And I bet lots of moms can recall their birth stories of what they had with their kids. I know of my wife's birth story, especially with Avery Joe. Liliana was a little easier, but both ended in C sections. Avery Joe was an emergency C section. It was 36 hours of labor. There was pain. There was wails. There was vomiting. There was some medical concerns. And then I can remember that as as she got cut in half almost, I got handed the baby and Avery Joe peed all over me. Great moment, you know, beginning of being a dad, but I could wipe that pee away. She bears the scars of those two C-sections forever out of love for her children. And our kids know that story, which is why my son wrote, thank you, mom, for, ne for nearly getting cut in half to bring me into this world. And so I really appreciate his honesty, my little artist that is Avery Joe. And I'll never forget how that changed our lives, just the joy of having that little one. But you know, a birth is a part of the plan. It's what, you know, by and large, part of the blessing that women have as part of their design. Now I realize on Mother's Day that some folks are adopted mothers. Some folks, they may not be a mother or a stepmom, but they can bless others. And certainly there are wonderful ladies who never had that privilege or were never called to have kids. And yet they blessed so many young women and young men around them and their life. And so we have lots to be thankful for. But this particular birth story, it didn't involve a C-section. It didn't involve doctors. It, it, it involved kind of a more, my wife tried a home birth. So it kind of involved closer to that with some with some doulas and some, you know, some local, you know, individual moms who had been through it before helping out. And that was the way they did things back then. There was no Pitocin. There was no, um, I just forgot the word, you know, there was no shot in the back, epidural. There we go. There was none of that to ease the pain. And this would have been au natural. And so this would have been a very different birth story. But you know what? This birth story that we're going to talk about today and the special mom, this was all prophesied way back in Genesis. So let me help you remember. This is something most of us know. Most of us maybe know this by heart. But let's think about this. 
the, how early this birth was planned, right? This was definitely something that God was foreseeing long for a long time, way back in Genesis, immediately after the fall. Eve was tempted by the servant. Eve took the fruit, probably not an apple. In fact, Jewish thought it was a pomegranate with each seed representing uh, some of the laws that they would then have to follow. But then after she took the fruit, she ate it and she gave it to her husband who was with her. We, we men often don't like to remember that part. We like to put the blame all on Eve, but Adam was right there. They both fell. They got kicked out of the garden. And as we talked about before, that was actually an act of mercy. It was part of the redemption plan. So they didn't eat other fruit there, like the fruit of life there in the garden. So they would get stuck in that irredeemable state. But they got kicked out. And then God dealt with the serpent who tempted them, which we know was no ordinary, just snake. Of course, hopefully you know that snakes don't talk to you, so you know that was already odd. But of course, this was the serpent, that dragon, the devil. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, if you're reading this for the first time and you didn't know who Jesus was and you didn't know that he was born of a virgin and you didn't know those things and you read this, you would think, well, that's a little odd. Why is the seed of the woman mentioned? Because even back then, they knew how babies were made, okay? And, and th that's an unusual phrase, an unusual way of looking at it. Well, the reason this is, is this is a prophecy here that there's going to be a very special birth. And John Sailhammer, an author and commentator uh, on the book of Genesis, he says that this was not so much to answer a bunch of questions, but instead to raise the question, who is the seed of woman? And this begins this looking forward through all of the Old Testament is who is going to come and save the day? Who is going to come and conquer those forces of evil? It sets up a war, but it gives hope. And all throughout the Old Testament, we have this hope that there is someone coming, a Messiah, a Savior, a King. And we're going to see in Isaiah, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 7, and then we'll move on to Luke 2. But Isaiah chapter 7 has more to say, starting in verse 10. But let me set the stage for you. The kingdom has been divided. You know, idolatry, high taxes, all the same problems we have today, actually. And the kingdom was divided and there was Judah in the south, which was largely faithful compared to the kingdom in the north, although the later kings also drifted away. But there wasn't really no good king in the north in Israel. And Israel and Judah were about to go to war. There was an Assyrian problem in the area, and there was this alliance between the king of Israel and the king of Aram. And they were trying to get Ahaz, who was the king in Israel. Now, he overlapped a little bit with his father as a king, but he was a king in Israel. And they're trying to get him to join their anti-Assyrian alliance, this political alliance. And when he says no, they decide, well, we're going to overthrow you, we're going to kill you, and we are going to put in a puppet king who will lead us or who will join us in, in leading his people to fight this battle. And so he is terrified. There's some soldiers coming. There's a war about to happen. And he thinks that something really bad is going to happen. But God sends Isaiah with a prophecy. So let's read Isaiah 7:10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Now, normally you're not supposed to ask for a sign, okay? Now, this time he's told to ask, and rather than do what the prophet says, he's kind of being resistant. Ahaz is afraid, and he's not really quite following through things the way that he's supposed to. But here we see that God is going to provide a sign. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be met with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, that is God with men. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So God is prophesying this judgment on these two kings that Ahaz is afraid of. And he's saying, by the time this baby who's about to be born is old enough to, do, to choose good and evil, this is a very Jewish idea here, like a bar mitzvah, you might have heard of those, he's going to be able to sin because at that point he will be accountable for his actions. Before that time, they're going to be dealt with. Well, that has special application for Mother's Day because I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, what happened 
to my baby who didn't make it out of the womb. And I know that's a sad issue, and I'm not trying to bring up pain, but actually I'm trying to provide comfort. You know, when, when David, he lost the baby that he had with Bathsheba, he and Bathsheba lost that baby, he said, I can't go, or that baby can't come back to me, but I can go to that baby. And then I can't help but think of my own mom as she was passing away. She knew the reality that she was leaving two boys behind, but there was three miscarriages she had. And so there was three siblings that I have in heaven that she was going to go and meet for the first time face to face. And she found comfort in there. It was a very Jewish idea. It was very, uh, something that is assumed in Scripture that we see hints of but may not be explicitly taught, but something I'm very convinced of that these little ones, as Paul would later say in the New Testament, sin had not sprung up in their life just yet. And so find comfort if you are one of those people or know some of those people who have lost a child in the womb. Right? That we live in a fallen world, we have fallen bodies, these things happen, but God is holy and just. And he's taken them on home. And so that is a good thing. But you'll see that this is a very localized, very current at the time prophecy. And yet, when we hear that a virgin and Emmanuel, we think, well, that's talking about Jesus. Well, what's going on here? Well, it's both. Okay, let me just spoil it for you now. It's both. So let's look ahead in Isaiah 8. Isaiah, the prophet himself, he's going to go and he's going to get with a prophetess and they're going to conceive. And, and he's given the definition of the baby's name in just a minute um, that you're going to read in Isaiah 8.1, but I'm going to skip that. We're just going to go straight to Isaiah 8.3. So I approached the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said to me, name him Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And we learn that this means swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. Now, my kids and my wife really got a good laugh out of this last night. They brought, I was actually at the office a little later than normal, and they brought dinner to me last night. And we talked about this. And let me just suggest, dear ladies, if you are about to have a child, could you put swift is the booty on the name list of not to name your kid? Now, of course, this is the kind of treasure one would receive from war. And so this is what's in view here, that this child signifies that the war will be over soon. That, and, you know, and that there's coming judgment for these individuals. But no, this name is an Emmanuel. So there was a prophecy about Emmanuel, and yet we here have a young, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. For before the boy knows how to cry out, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria, that would be Israel uh, in the north here, will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Again, the Lord spoke to me further saying, and I'm not going to go through everything, but you can see that there's this prophecy that's going on two levels, that there's God with men, and then there's also this boy here, Mr. Swift is the booty, uh, fast is the prey. And these are two different kids in view. So there is this momentary, these enemies will be dealt with, and this is a sign that they'll be dealt with, but there's also something more. And Isaiah would continue to prophesy, and he would even say this in Isaiah 9, 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah's son was never called those things. So you might hear sometimes, oh, they, they messed that up. Oh, you silly Christians. The word is Alma. We talked about that last week. That doesn't necessarily mean virgin. Actually, in that culture, it absolutely did because it meant a young unmarried girl of a marry, marriageable age, right? And they guarded young women at the time and they waited until marriage to engage in sex. And so they made sure this would have been a virgin. But there was two things in view here, a very Jewish idea that there is this partial fulfillment, which is a glimpse of the future. Keep that in mind as we think about Passover as well, because that's going to come up at the end of this message. There is this glimpse of the future, and then there is a final fulfillment of that later. And so with that in mind, God has been hinting all the time, but now the time is right. We spent a couple weeks here in Luke, covering Luke 1. Now we're in Luke chapter 2, and God the Son is going to take on flesh and it's the time for that God with us. It's the time for the Messiah to come and be born. So we're going to go our chapter by chapter study through Luke. We're going to go into chapter 2, starting in verse 1. A very familiar passage to most of us. 
Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Corinus was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. We talked about some of these details last week, but I want to remind you that, remember, Luke's the one writing this down, but who is Luke interviewed? He's got Matthew, he's got Mark, but Mary was a part of the early church, and it's very likely that Luke is interviewing Mary, and that's where he's getting some of these details that we don't have in the other Gospels. Now, we don't have an exact date or evidence for this individual census, but we see and we have extra-biblical evidence, and that's what I mean, extra-biblical, Bible's evidence enough, right? But we have extra-biblical evidence that these censuses take place somewhat frequently, anytime that they need to raise some soldiers, raise some taxes to fight a war, or if new leaders are installed in certain areas. And so if a Caesar decides this leader's a failure in this area, we're kicking him out, there's a new leader in his place, well, then they might take a census. And what they're doing is they're just figuring out, well, how much can I charge for taxes? How many soldiers might I have if I need it? any of those things. And you'll note that it says they went up, but if you look on a map, it looks like they went south. Why is that? Well, that's because, of course, they went up some mountains. They geographically went up. And it was actually about an 80-mile trip. Now, I don't know about you all, but we traveled a bit when my wife was pregnant. In fact, when she was pregnant with Avery Joe, she went from Alaskan temperatures in Juneau, Alaska, got off an airplane in Ohio, and it was, you know, she went from 50 degrees to like 95 degrees. That was a pretty rough thing for a pregnant lady. And so, so traveling some 80 miles without a car, without a jet plane, maybe on a donkey, maybe walking some of it, that would be pretty intense. And so she's probably recalling these stories to Luke, and I wonder if there were some antidotes, because I can remember traveling with a pregnant lady, and that meant lots of extra stops for pee breaks. So verse 6, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. We often imagine that they come into this town, we see all these modern retellings, and I appreciate the intent of their heart, but they're not entirely accurate. And they burst into town, and they're looking everywhere, and she's like about to deliver. Well, actually, it says while they were there. And so they may have actually been there a little bit. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And we'll talk about her other born sons a bit later, because she did have them, despite what you may hear. And she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I won't dwell on this the same amount of time I dwelt on it at Christmas time. Uh, but as you guys probably have heard, or if you've, you've heard me address this issue before, in is a bad translation of the word Cataluma. They did not have Motel 6. They did not have Holiday Inn Expresses. They didn't have that. The King James used that word. And as we've understood the culture, the language a little bit better later on, lots of other translations have followed suit. But really, the best translation is guest room, right? In this culture, when you traveled somewhere, You stayed with somebody who was family or maybe even somebody who was a stranger. So nobody was leaving the light on for you. You depended on the kindness of other people. And houses typically look something like this. You know, they would have straw on the roof that you could uh, have mixed in with mud and twigs, and it would actually make it to where you could stand on it. And of course, we would see later in the Gospels, you could even take part of it apart if necessary. Uh, Houses that had a little more affluence, would have a separate room for the kids, maybe even a separate room for boys and girls, but often there would be one bedroom, maybe elevated or uplifted above where the animals would be kept. And yes, the animals would come inside at night. And why? You didn't want anyone to steal them. And so they would have, you know, their chicken or or whatever they were milking or, you know, just a small group of animals. They would bring them inside at nighttime. And that guest room would often be the roof, or if they were really wealthy, it might be some, a separate full room that they would have uh, up in the upper room, That's, that sounds familiar, where people could gather. Uh, and there sometimes would be a staircase on the outside. There would sometimes be what we might call a little honeymoon suite or a little newlyweds uh, built on room for a new family. Or if there was a large family or large area, they might even build out a compound and have several houses like this kind of together and walled in. Here you can see a recreation of what this might look like. And yes, there would be mangers, and they had those at night. Why? 
because they wanted to keep the animals quiet so they could sleep, right? I don't know about you, I have a pug and a cat in, in my, our bedroom at nighttime, the pug in the kennel and the cat usually at my feet, and they can make noise, and sometimes I want them to hush. And here is an actual um, a dig that they found one of these houses. And you can see the two levels here. And in the poorest of houses, this level would be all that divided them from the animals. So the animals would be right there next to them. So it wasn't quite a barn. Uh, sometimes you'll hear about a cave. Some of these houses would be built on tops of caves if they could. But this was a small family home. And when they were going and traveling, they didn't live there, so they would have to depend on the family. And there was no room for them in the guest room because there was some other family there. If they were all having to travel to Jerusalem, there'd be lots of people staying. Now, I appreciate the idea that you usually hear at Christmas, you know, make room for Jesus. There's no room for him in the end here. You need to make room for Jesus. Not exactly based on the correct understanding of the story, but you know what? If you look at the accurate story, I bet you if the people in the guest room understood who was being born downstairs, they might be willing to swap places. That would be a different situation. So we might still be able to properly pull out the application that we should make better room and make sure he has the highest priority in our life. But of course, she's going to give birth right there, and she's going to be surrounded by the ladies that are going to help her, and something really amazing is going to happen. Now, we usually celebrate this at Christmas, and I know it's Mother's Day, but you might be asking, why on earth is Christmas the date that it is? Because I've heard all these other crazy things about that date. Well, the way we got that date in the early church, they believed, and in the early Jewish world, they believed that you died, at least if you were really important, on the same day that you were conceived. And they knew it took nine months. So they went, hmm, March 25th is Easter by the Jewish calendar, so we just count nine months forward. That's December 25th. That must have been when Jesus was born. And now, and we know that that date was celebrated by Christians before any pagan copied it. It was at least 100 years. So yeah, did there other celebrations happen? Sure. But was it some kind of pagan copy? No. It was just this weird local idea that they had that really isn't quite accurate. We don't know when that date was, but it was special. Now think about it from Mary's perspective. This young mom, a virgin, she's not married yet. People are looking at her. She knows. Her husband now knows that the Holy Spirit did a miracle. But everybody else is looking at her going, this is not how our culture is supposed to do it, Right? And she's had to travel. She's not in her own home. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. She probably had plans for her life. And now here she is holding this newborn baby who she's looking at and knowing this is my baby. And yet there's something really special about this baby. Now, let's look at the first people who are going to meet this baby besides mom, dad, and the family that are there. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. It's sometimes pointed out that when you get called a sheep in Scripture, or when Jesus calls people a sheep, that isn't quite a compliment. Now, some of you are farmers. I grew up on a farm. We had goats. They were slightly smellier and slightly dumber than sheep, okay? We had fainting goats. It was really fun to kind of scare them, and then they would lock up, you know, and they'd do this thing, and then they'd kind of fall over or lean on something. It was kind of fun. But they were hard to deal with, and they needed some protection. Now, sheep, they're not bright. They're going to walk into thorns, and you're going to have to pull them out. And so, yes, sheep aren't bright. But you know what else isn't a compliment? Being called a shepherd, right? Think about it. At the time when Jesus came onto the scene and Jesus was born, he didn't come to, or it wasn't announced to the highest kings or the academics or the religious leaders of the day. It was announced to shepherds. And at the time, they looked at shepherds as dirty workmen. They were out in the fields with large amount of animals. They slept with their animals. And you know what? They probably smelled like their animals. They were seen as untrustworthy lots of times. And so he comes to this lowly group of working men, dirty, common men. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and singing glory to God in the highest. 
and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had heard, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at these things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. God, Jesus, as a shepherd, he was willing to come down and be with us in the midst of our dirt, just like those shepherds are in the midst of their animals, pulling out thickets, maybe even getting bugs on them. I don't know if you've ever gotten a tick on you like I did when I worked on the family farm. Jesus was now right there among them, the lowest of the low, us. And they got to partake and see, and they praised God for it. And Mary heard all this thing. And you know the song, Mary, did you know? Well, there's one thing about knowing or hearing something, and there's experiential knowledge. So it's, well, I've been told this, but going through it, just like I've been told, you know, being a parent will change your life. I knew that. I saw the responsibility coming at me like a freight train, but then to actually experience the getting called dad, dad, or actually experiencing having to ground your kid for their own good, right? All those things, they're different when you actually go through them. And moms, you know this. It's one thing, all the ideas you thought you had about motherhood versus how it actually worked out and some of the challenges you would have never believed that you had to endure through your motherhood. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just has had been told them. So the good news was starting to get out. And Mary's sitting there pondering. She's got this baby and there's already signs confirming, yes, something special is about this baby. Her birth story was very different. Well, I want us to fast forward as we think about Mother's Day. And we're not going to go there and we're not going to read all of it, but John 19 lets us know that Mary was at the crucifixion. I mentioned earlier that Jewish prophecy and Jewish uh, miracles, all those understandings, those were often cyclical in nature and they often foreshadowed things. Just as the virgin birth in Isaiah, you know, there was a birth then, but it foreshadowed the birth of Jesus later. Well, also, there was this thing called Passover. Very recently, we had Josh Sofer from Jews for Jesus explain how Christ was seen in the Passover and all those things that are going. But from the perspective of Mary, who was getting to see the crucifixion, think about it this way. This young mom held her first baby boy against her. She fed him. There was no bottle or formula. She changed him. She cleaned up after him. She watched him grow up. And next week we get to continue seeing a young Jesus and and how God showed Jesus off in a sense to some of his faithful servants. But she did all this. And at some point, she heard Messiah, Savior. Well, she also grew up as a young Jewish lady. And she knew that once a year at Passover time, they brought in this lamb and it was cute and cuddly and it was perfect and spotless. And they no doubt would love on that lamb just like a little kid does. does. We had kids over at our farm and they'd pet on our cows and, and you know, we'd, we'd eventually eat those cows and they didn't you know, quite get the two things together at the same time. And at some point, that, you know, towards the end of the Passover, the lamb was killed as the Passover lamb. That's the blood that would go over the doorpost. Mary would have heard her son talk about being the Passover lamb. Mary would hear that he was going to provide that salvation. What horrifying moment it would have had to have been when Mary finally realized what was happening. That the baby boy she held in her arms was going to have to die and she was going to have to watch It's one thing for her to recognize, oh, my Savior's in my womb. But then it was her baby on the cross. One of the hardest things moms do is let go. Last week I said it, and this week I have to say it again. The biggest impact you may have on this world, and probably will have on this world if you're a parent, is not some work that you do, but it's someone that you raise. Now, it's true, you're not raising Jesus. You don't have a perfect child. And sometimes we have to remind our children that they are not perfect and that they are not God incarnate because they think the universe revolves around them. And that is one of the things that we must do as parents is to remind them that the world does not revolve around just them. 
But you have to get them ready to do what God has called them to do. And that even means getting them ready to launch out, seeing them get hurt, seeing them endure pain, and making sure that they can live past your own life and not be overly dependent on you, and even seeing them sometimes say goodbye. I said last week, and I have to say it again, I think sometimes we as Protestants, because we don't want to elevate or worship Mary in an inappropriate way, and then Catholics would say they just venerate, they're looking at her as as an example, we sometimes shy away from this aspect of Mary. But I am stunned by this, this blessed woman who was a young mom, was faithful all the way through, followed her son around as he became the leader and in charge and became Savior. And I'm stunned by the pain that she had to have experienced. Now, we can learn from her example in that we can be faithful to whatever God has called us to and pour into our children because we should all want to glorify God with how we raise our children or how we influence our children to raise their grandchildren. And so I'm thankful for all the moms, but also I'm encouraging you and moms, grandmoms, ladies, you have some kind of influence, even if you're not a mom, to get your kids ready for whatever God has in store for them for their life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at this birth story. We thank you for the faithfulness of this young mom. And we thank you, of course, for our Lord and Savior. We're excited to follow him and we're excited to see a baptism today. And Lord, we would ask that you would help us, whatever our role is in a family, that we would do it in a way that would glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.